Thank you, Tony, for this uh, introduction. I'm very happy to be here to represent the MAPS faculty. The title of my PhD is Variational Water Wave Models and Pyramidal Freak Waves with Implications for Global Shipping. So that's quite a long title with probably some terms that you don't know, so I'm going to explain to you what this means. So first, uh, freak waves. Maybe you've heard of freak waves, but if you haven't, I'd like to show you this documentary introduction from the BBC, uh, which was published a few years ago. There is something out at sea, terrorizing the world shipping. Out of the darkness came this great wall of water. I've never seen a wave as big as this in my whole life. It can strike out of the blue with devastating consequences. You hit solid water and it is like running into a brick wall. The entire bridge was wrecked. Horrific. Monstrous. You feel as if the end of the world has come. This is the story of a wave that is sinking ships around the world. A killer that defies all scientific understanding and that no ship is designed to withstand. So this movie really shows the challenging aspect of freak waves. They are killer that defies all scientific understanding and that no ship is designed to withstand. And indeed, it defies all scientific understanding. The top picture here shows the first evidence of a, re a freak wave, and that was recorded only in 1995. Before that, scientists could not believe that such a, an extreme and sudden phenomena could occur. They thought these were just some mariner's legends. And I'd like to draw your attention to the left-hand scale of this picture because it shows that this wave here, which is 20 meters high, and if you remember what the man said in the movie, this is like being hit by a brick wall. The second picture shows the freak waves observed between 2006 and 2010, and it highlights a second very important aspect of freak waves, which is that they can't be avoided. As you can see, they occur on highly populated regions and on main shipping routes. So this is a first motivation to my PhD project, which is a European project funded by the Marie Curie Actions. I worked in the department of um, applied mathematics with Arno Bogov and Mark Kalmanson. And my objective there was to develop a mathematical and numerical model of extreme waves in order to be able to reproduce the dynamics of such waves. Because the second point also stated in the BBC movie is that no ship is designed to withstand such waves. And indeed, two large ships sink in the ocean every week, and this has dramatic consequences for the crews, the passengers, and the maritime industry. This is why my project was also in collaboration with the Maritime Research Institute of Netherlands, Marine, where I worked with Tim Benek and Riyad Katzenberg in order to customize my models so that they can be used to improve the design of ships. So modeling is quite a vague notion, so I'm going to explain to you what it means from the mathematical point of view. It starts from the observation of a situation that we cannot explain with the existing knowledge. So in our case, this is the fact that two ships sink in the ocean every week because of extreme wave conditions. Then we try to describe this situation in mathematical terms, and that's the fun part with tricky equations. So this is an equation that I'm going to show you today, but I have to show this because this is really what I am doing. And actually, every single object around you may be described by an equation like this. So this equation here describes the evolution of the height of the wave and the evolution of their velocity. But if we look at this equation, we don't really see what's really going on. So this is why we also need to do a numerical approximation, which aims to visualize the solution of this equation. So these are the numerical simulation of a freak wave, which you see now which is the solution of this equation. So these are the three main aspects of what I call modeling, and there were the three main aspects of my PhD. Something weird there. Uh, so first I worked, I discussed with Marin to understand how I should build my models to understand the industrial challenges. This is what we call the refinement of models. Their requirements were to get wave generation from wave makers, so this is the top simulation there. Wave absorption from the beach, this is the second 
simulation, and the objective of this is to mimic what happens in real sea and in the experimental wave tanks. And they were wanted also some freak wave simulations to test the impact on ships. So first, I spent 18 months in Leeds, where I developed my mathematical models, and I derived some robust methods in order to be able to capture such extreme physics. These methods are what we call the discretization methods. So the idea is that the equation that I showed you is solved on a finite number of elements in space and time, exactly like it's the same principle as pixels in an image. An image is made of thousands of small elements, the pixels, on which the color of the image is averaged. So if I take only four elements to describe this image and I average the color, the resulting image will be very poor. We can't recognize the wave. So we have to increase the number of elements until we get something which is satisfying. And we do exactly the same for our numerical approximation. We split the domain into small elements on which we average the solution of our equation in order to be able to visualize it. Once we obtain satisfying results, we can say that the methods, the discretization methods, are consistent. But we have to be careful because consistency doesn't mean that you can trust your results. It doesn't mean that they are the true results. In order to, to be able to, to make sure that we can use them to predict what happens in real life, you also need to compare them to real life observation. And this is what we call validation of results. This is why I also spent 18 months at Marin in order to compare my numerical model to um, experimental data. So for example, this is a comparison between the numerical wave elevation and the experimental wave elevation. So it shows that they behave the same way. And from that, from that we know that we can use the model to predict what happens in the real life and that the models are accurate. So we can use them for diverse applications, and that brings me to the impact of this project. Thanks to the models, we are now able to reproduce the dynamics of freak waves in uh, experimental wave tanks. So Marin can use these models to generate a freak wave at a, in a target area in the basin to test the impact on, freak, on, on ships. So this is really a step forward in the improvement of ship designs. I put some effort to get uh, simulations that are fast so that you don't need to wait hours, days, or even months to get your results. So for instance, uh, for comparison, the simulation of the freak wave here took one hour to be computed, while those at Marin, with the model existing at Marin, took 39 hours. It's also an improvement in terms of energy saving because my model can run on my laptop on just one core, while their model was running on 32 cores on supercomputers. So in total, it's a 1,200-fold core hour reduction. So it's really a gain of time, of power, and of course of money. The realistic wave generators and wave absorption in my model can be used by Marin to optimize their experimental setups. Basically, they can check that the wave maker inputs that they want to use will generate the wave that they expect in the basin. So why is that important for them? Because experiments are very expensive. It, take, it costs between five and 10,000 euros per day to do experiments in the lab, while my model is free. So they can really try uh, the wave maker inputs, and, and once they are satisfied with the resulting wave, they can generate it uh, in the tank and test the impact on shapes. These are the main industrial impacts, and in terms of research, I have made my codes available online so that uh, everyone can access it, and I have put some detailed tutorials for those who would like to use them. So this is, for instance, the case of Salva et al, who used my uh, water wave model to um, test wave impacts on wind turbines. Similarly, in addition to the data that I used to validate my uh, numerical simulations, I provided extra data that can be used for validation of future work, for extension of my work. So no additional funding will be required for that. And finally, I've, I've done several outreach activities to try to convince people around me that math is actually fun. You, could, you can do um, very exciting things, and it's really used to solve daily issues around us. Uh, so this is me at one of the open days. And the top figure shows the countries from which the blog was visited, so quite a worldwide audience. Thank you very much for your attention, and good luck to the other.
Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to wander over to the panel again. Uh, questions from the panel? <laughs> yeah, there's silence. <laughs> silence again. I can open it up uh, wider. Oh, it was, uh, Claire was <laughs> formulating. Uh, we, can, we can take questions more widely. Yes, we have one over here. Thank you. Um, it seems to me there's quite a, a saving to the industry from this. Are you profiting in any way? Me? Yes. It seems that you've done an awful lot of work um, and you're providing your software effectively for free. So, uh, sorry, can you repeat? Are there any commercial, um, are there any commercial implications where you could develop this and um, make money? Ah, okay. Uh, for industry, yes, because then well, if two ships sink in the ocean every week, it means that a lot of money is lost uh, because of this. So, and these ships are large ships of more than 100 tons, so they um, transport containers or passengers and so on. So everything that is on the containers and so on is lost. So they really need to get safer ships uh, to ensure uh, safety on board and, and to save uh, money because this has a dramatic impact for, for maritime industry. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the middle. <laughs> I've got my watch on to collect steps, so I'm doing all right on steps. <laughs> uh, thank you. I was wondering, um, what is the current state of, are we able to predict where freak waves arise, and does your research lead to uh, better, will it eventually lead to us being better able to predict where they arise? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, I said the first wave was recorded in 1995, and since then, most of their research was focused on trying to understand when and where these waves will occur, to predict them. Uh, but actually, most of the conclusions are that we cannot predict them. They, they've thought of some reasons why they could occur. For instance, in South Africa, when the waves go against the current, they, they noticed that there were lots of freak waves there. So they first said, okay, let's just avoid these currents and, and find other shipping routes. But then they faced other freak waves and, and in their conclusion is that we can't predict them. And that's why it's very important to be able to resist uh, to these waves when a ship encounters these waves. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have a final question or are we, okay. Okay, right, thank you very much. And a round of applause. Thank you for following. <laughs>